Hello everyone, I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week I'm taking a brief look at the classic board game from Milton Bradley, HeroQuest. This seminal board game attempted to meld the classic elements of Dungeons and & Dragons and fantasy RPGs with traditional board game elements to forge an exciting adventure game experience. There are a ton of videos and resources already on YouTube and elsewhere on this classic game, so I won't be doing a full D20 evaluation on this game, but I would like to point out some of the online resources, discuss the history, and a little bit of the gameplay. So let's just sit back, relax, and let me take you on a tour of the wonders of HeroQuest. Released in 1989 in the UK and in 1990 in the US, HeroQuest came with 31 detailed miniatures, lots of tiny furniture, the quest booklets, spell and treasure cards, and more. The HeroQuest box just came jam-packed with delicious gamer eye candy. Gameplay for HeroQuest is easy, quick, and actually rather dynamic, and how to play can be learned in just a few minutes. The game is played with up to five players, four hero players of the typical fantasy archetypes, barbarian, dwarf, elf, and wizard. The fifth player takes on the role of the evil wizard Zargon, or Melkor if you're in Europe, and basically is the referee or dungeon master of the game, controlling all the monsters and revealing the contents of rooms as the game progresses. The barbarian is the typical warrior archetype, his Conan clone prominent on the front of the box. The Barbarian deals the most damage and can take the most punishment, but is the weakest in mind points. The Dwarf is a warrior as well, though not quite as tough as the Barbarian. The Dwarf can disarm a trap without the need for a toolkit. The Elf is both a warrior of some skill, but can also cast spells. And finally, the Wizard, who is weak on body and attack, but comes with many spells that can be instrumental in turning the tide against the forces of chaos. Zargon forces consist of an array of nasties that include undead, such as mummies, zombies, and skeletons, humanoids, such as orcs, goblins, and fimmer, as well as demonic-like creatures such as the very heavily armed Chaos Warriors, the Chaos Warlock, and the Fearsome Gargoyle. Statistics for these creatures are provided conveniently on the included Zargon screen, on monster cards, and variations can be found on several of the quests. In addition to the included 14 initial quests, there is a blank quest map that can be photocopied to allow players to create their own quests as well. The way the game board is enabled is actually quite clever, with each of the quests altering and changing the setup for a nearly infinite number of combinations. As you can see from this quest map here, the shaded areas are essentially considered solid rock and inaccessible. In the initial series of 14 quests, each quest is a different dungeon location. In later expansions, each quest is actually part of the same complex. Game layout is pretty simple. Zargon lays out the game's components in a convenient manner, sets up Zargon's screen with the quest booklet behind, out of sight of the other players. The spiral staircase or entrance to the dungeon is placed in the appropriate room, and then each player takes a turn, starting with a player on Zargon's left, and continues in that order clockwise around the table, with Zargon going last. This turn order is maintained until the end of the game. Winning is accomplished simply by completing the quest's objective, or the defeat or deaths of the characters, in which case, Zargon the evil wizard player wins. Each player has a character card, and the character stats are attack dice, defend dice, mind points, and body points. This is all pretty straightforward. To attack, the player rolls the number of dice equal to their attack die score, and any skulls rolled on the specialty hero quest dice equal a hit. The defender rolls their defense dice. For monster, they use a black shield, and heroes use the white shield face of the dice, and that eliminates each success. Any remaining successes count as damage and go to the character's body points. Most monsters only have one or two body points, while heroes have between four for the wizard and eight for the barbarian. When all of a character's body points are gone, that character is dead. 
Mind points are used to defend against magic spells and effects. While character statistics don't ever improve, heroes are able to keep any treasure or items they pick up during a quest, and things like armor and weapons that improve a character's statistics can be acquired at the various shops between quests. While produced by Milton Bradley, the game was done in collaboration with Games Workshop, so much of the aesthetics of the game in regards to the look of the miniatures and the overall storylines of the quests are drawn heavily from Games Workshop's Warhammer setting. As you can see here from the map provided in the Witchlord expansion, that is the same setting as Warhammer. The core storyline of the game revolves around the evil wizard Zargon, Zargon is the former apprentice of the wizened wizard mentor who guides, trains, and assigns the heroes on their quests. There were quite a few expansions to the game between 1990 and 1994, the first of which was Keller's Keep, followed by Return of the Witchlord. Many quest packs were only released in Europe and not in the U.S., and that includes the Adventure Design Kit, Against the Ogre Horde, and Wizards of Morkar. Further U.S. releases included the Frozen Horror Barbarian Quest Pack and the Mage in the Mirror, a quest pack for the Elf. Each quest pack added additional components such as miniatures, tiles, traps, and artifacts to the game, as well as 10 additional quests to play, following a central storyline. For example, in the original quest booklet, Defeating the Witchlord was a major quest, encompassing several adventures. In the Witchlord expansion pack, the Witchlord returns to further trouble the realm and the heroes. Hero Quest was extremely popular with its easy to learn and fast gameplay, engaging storyline and attractive presentation. It really hit a mark in both look and design that other imitators have never really managed to capture. For that reason, the long out of print game is a bit of a collector's item with an original complete box set going for hundreds of dollars. The even rarer expansions go for more. My advice on collecting this game is to do so in pieces. If you try to buy a complete game all at once, it's just going to be prohibitively expensive. However, you can buy parts and pieces at reasonable prices. While this might take you several months of carefully watching eBay, in the end you can acquire things for a lot less. There are several creators on Etsy that are 3D printing everything from miniatures to furniture to doors. There's a dedicated and useful website called Ye Old Inn that has tons and tons of HeroQuest resources including scans of magic spells, treasures, and all of the various printed components. Though, I will warn you now, once you start down this dark path, forever will it... Well, you get the idea. I remember back in the days before D&D miniatures were not so ubiquitous, HeroQuest miniatures were my go-to for orcs and undead. The original box set sold for only $40, which was a real steal considering the thing came with 31 miniatures. The doors were great too. You could just set them up on the table and use them to note marching order when opening a door and so on. Add in the minis from Dragon's Quest board game, and you have yourself a pretty nice selection of opponents for your campaigns. Anyone else use these miniatures for their games? Let me know in the comments. Several years ago, there was an attempt to bring HeroQuest back for a 25th anniversary edition with a Kickstarter by a group out of Spain called GameZone. Unfortunately, there was an IP dispute between GameZone and Moon Designs Publication, who owns a trademark for HeroQuest role-playing game in the United States. The dispute is rather involved, so I won't get into it here except to say that obviously the Kickstarter was cancelled. Over the years, Games Workshop also produced several games in the style of the HeroQuest game from Milton Bradley. There was, of course, Advanced HeroQuest, which used the miniatures and furniture from the original game, but added more complex combat and character rules, a tile system for dungeon placement and rules for henchmen. After that, Games Workshop also released Warhammer Quest. This was entirely a new game system, though similar in scope to Advanced HeroQuest. Finally, if you are still not convinced that HeroQuest is a great game, then let me direct you to Bardic Broadcast's video on the subject. Check it out. You won't be sorry. Look at the muscularity. I can't help myself. Anyway, 
Thank you all so much for watching. Even though brief, I hope you found this video informative and useful. This Saturday, I will continue my delve into basic D&D reviews with a look at the Dawn of the Emperor's box set. As usual, I'd like to give a big shout out and thank you to all my patrons. If you enjoyed this review, please subscribe and click the little bell so you'll get updates when I add new content. Please give this video a like, comment, and share. Join the channel's Facebook page, RPG Reviews, and consider supporting the channel by becoming a Patreon yourself. Or alternatively, you can just send a tip through the PayPal tip jar. Link is in the description. And as always, my friends, may your d20 roll true and game on. <laughs>